Hello and welcome to tonight's performance, uh, Madam C.J. Walker, Her Life and Business. Uh, tonight's performance is sponsored by the Friends of Duncan Library. The Friends of Duncan Library were generous enough to both fund the Zoom account that allows us to securely host Madam Walker uh, without threat or fear of Zoom bombers, but they also uh, were generous enough to compensate Madam Walker for her time here with us tonight. So if you'd like to see more great speakers like Madam Walker in the future, um, consider becoming a friend of Duncan Library. You can do so for as little as $25 a year. Um, and that funds all the great programs at Duncan Library. Um, now tonight we are joined by Madam Walker. Um, I could go on and on about her, but I'm gonna let her speak for herself. If at any point tonight you have questions for Madam Walker, feel free to put those in the chat box or the Q&A box, and I will make sure that Madam Walker sees your question. All right, without further ado, join me in welcoming Madam Walker. Such a delight. Uh, thank you for allowing me to come and speak with you today. I have been particularly excited to be back in the Virginia area to talk about the products that I have. And whether your hair is long or short, whether you need thicker hair or thinner hair, whatever your hair is, I have those products and for your skin as well. And ladies, all the extra accoutrements that you might need. I am delighted to be here with you. Now, most of you know that I do sell for not a very high price at all, the basics. I will sell you, of course, the vegetable hair shampoo grower. Uh, I do think I have a picture of it here. Hold on a moment. Uh, they put these uh, these uh, pictures together for me so that I might be able to share them. Usually, of course, I would show you the product and I have put them into yellow boxes now. So they are much easier to be identified from anything else that you would uh, have about your house and you wouldn't have to worry about it so much. Uh, but yes, I have the my uh, vegetable, uh, my vegetable shampoo uh, that I that uh, is probably my most popular of all the things that I have right here. And it is my own personal, my own personal formula. You'll notice the, the picture on the front. Uh, that would be my adopted granddaughter. Oh, she is just a a wonderful young lady attended the uh, attended the um, Charlotte uh, Charlotte Hawkins Brown's school over in North Carolina, a fine school for for Negro and colored young ladies. And I'm right, I'm very proud of the work that she's doing there. And so I'm glad that you all have a chance to see that. And then, of course, you are well aware of my wonderful uh, my moisturizer uh, that I have and the hair grower. And I do believe it was Jean who said that she needed something else for her hair. And I, I would say that Jean, this is what you want to be able to use is my hair grower, uh, along with the uh, along with my with my vegetable shampoo. Now you would use both of them together. And uh, and I, as you see, I have put my adopted granddaughter on the front of that as well. Her hair is so thick and lush. Uh, it, one of the reasons that I, I wanted to have her uh, come into our family, not only for that, she was smart as she could be. Her mother uh, was a single woman and had many children. And, and so we, we brought her along and it has been wonderful to have her as a part of our family. She is just uh, an amazing young lady. Oh, I, I see that you have a question for me already. Yeah, um, we have an audience member, Lynn, who would like to know, uh, are your formulas, your original formulas, still the ones in use? Well, of course. And of course, you don't know what the formula is. I can't tell you the formula. Now, you might ask where I got the formula from, and I will tell you only this. If it would help you to know that I dreamed one night about an African man who stood up and spoke to me from far off and told me what to put into the ingredients, if that will help you buy my product, you may believe that. If it would help you to better understand that I was working at the pharmacist, uh, doing some cooking there at the pharmacy, and, and one day the pharmacist looked at some of the other products that I had and looked at it and gave me other ways to make it better, if that will help you buy the product, then that's what I did. Or if it will help you to think that I worked night and day looking to have the right work, working together along with the pharmacist himself. If that would help you do it, and that would help you buy the product, that's what I did. Whatever you need to know that will help you buy my product, I will tell you that is how I came about it. 
but it is only for me to know. And of course, my daughter, Lilia, and, uh, and Lavinia's children and all you know, those that helped me in that particular part of the company. And so that is what is in those products today, indeed. Well, I, I enjoy the product and I do believe it would work well. But Ms. Risley, uh, Risley or Risley, Hannah, I, I always say it wrong, please forgive me. Uh, and she, she said that uh, she wanted to make sure that I shared a little bit about myself. She didn't know some of the things that I, that I had know that I had been through, and I said I would. And so I, I suppose you are the, I don't know if it would be beneficiary, but you are the ones that will have your ears pulled a bit while I share a bit about my life. But I will come back to my product, and do not worry. Uh, it is a bit warm in here. Let me take off. This is just a simple mink stole, and. Um, I don't wear it until it's cold a little bit on the inside, but let me take this off. I have been with the ladies and I always tell them to wear their, their fine white shirt and sometimes a black a gray sweater over it and their black uh, skirt, which of course you can't see, and to be the, always looking your finest wherever you go. The Walker women are known for how pristine they are and how they look at all times that their hair is fine, that the hats they wear, that the gloves that we wear, that the outfit we wear, that we everybody will know when the Walker women are coming by. And as Madam C.J. Walker, myself, I lead by example so that Walker women who are able to lift up their community and environment can make the best of themselves and the community around them. But it is nice to have the the nicer things as well. I always tell my ladies, make sure you have dreams. Who knows, you might get some of them at some point in time. And uh, I could never have known that I would be a person coming from where I came from that would have minks and mink stoles, uh, even have a, even have one of those uh, Cadillacs. Well, I actually have two cars. And, uh, but it, and one of the cars, the Cadillac, goes up to 35 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. It nearly outraces all the horses that are on the street. Loud as can be and that dark smoke that comes out of the back of it uh, sounds worse than a horse, but I tell you, it will get you to someplace else as quick as possible. And I have my own chauffeur, <laughs> but enough. I, I am simply and still just a Southern girl in so many ways. I was born in Delta, Louisiana. Now, I was the first of my parents' children, Minerva and Owen. I was the first of their children born free. My parents, uh, the Breedloves, and I was born Sarah Breedlove, nothing like the name I have now, but I was born on the very plantation that my parents had worked on. And now free, they were on the same plantation, but now they were, they were sharecroppers. And the truth of it is, I expected that I most likely would grow up and marry a sharecropper myself, that I most likely would stay on those hills in Louisiana, but that was not what life was to be. And so being the fifth child and I grew up working when I was young, going to school for a bit, but then getting out to the field as quickly as I could be put. And then my mother died first and my father a year later, by the age of seven years, I was an orphan. Well, my sister Lavinia and uh, her husband, <clears throat> well, they were in Vicksburg. Now, I have to tell you, as a little girl, I where I lived in Delta, I could look right across that great Mississippi and I could see into Vicksburg. I could see those big steamers come in, the large wheel that would be around and those fancy ladies that would come off that ship, colored ladies as well as white ladies. And they'd come off and they'd have parasols and fine hats and fine gowns. And I so wanted to be those ladies. But for me, it was just a dream. I moved to Vicksburg. I certainly didn't come by any great steamer or have any fancy clothing that I wore. I merely began to live with my sister and her, her husband. 
I did a little cotton picking over there, just like I had done across the water, but also worked in folks' houses. It was a hard time for me, I will say. But it became worse when my 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 sister's husband became worse. He began to <clears throat> look at me in ways that I learned very quickly I did not desire to be looked at. He was a hard man. And I knew if I did not leave that house, that I certainly, certainly would be taken advantage of in every way. And so I found myself leaving home. And at the age of 14, I was married. That may sound young to you, but it wasn't in Mississippi. In most of the South, you can marry as young as someone would let you marry, it seemed like. But at 14, I married Moses McWilliams. He was a good young man and good to me. We had our daughter, Alilia. The truth of the matter, that's the name she gave herself. Her name was Lilia. That's the name I gave her. She became all high and mighty by the time that she moved over to New York and, and she began to, well, before she even moved there, when she was over in school, uh, over in Tennessee, she gave herself the name, uh, Lilia, to make herself sound more fancy. But she was just born Lilia. <laughs> but I loved that girl. And I was happy with Moses. I was. But Moses, Moses died a few, two years later or such. I think that he was killed, but that's neither here nor there. And that's when I had a choice. We all have choices. Each of us has to make a choice about which direction we'll go. Do we go forward into uh, what may be the unknown or do we go back to what we may know, know but what is comfortable and, and where we know how we'll get along? Each one of us has to make those choices. Opportunities are laid in front of us and we have to decide where we are going. This was one of those opportunities. Did I go back and live with my sister Lavinia and that man of hers? Or did I move forward into the unknown? I was fortunate. My brothers had moved to St. Louis and they were working as barbers. As most of y'all men know, barbers are some of the most well-paid gentlemen that there are, and particularly colored barbers. And, and my brothers only worked on white hair. They had a choice then. You had to either work on only white hair or only colored hair. You couldn't do both. But because they worked only on white hair, they were able to have enough money in their pockets where they could be almost bankers at that time, where they would loan out things well respected. And so I moved to where my brothers were. And I lived in St. Louis. <laughs> now, some of y'all don't know nothing about St. Louis. Mm -mm. I was in St. Louis when it was popping. Whoop, Lord have mercy. We were singing the St. Louis blues. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> oh, it wasn't nothing to go on down and get a little drink or go to one of the little places and have a little taste of something and things like that. And I didn't do a whole lot of that. I, but I will say that it was nothing to get a... Mm, Mm, to see them men with their fine spats on that they had and their boiler hats upon their head, their hair greased down and greased back. Woo, they looked good. St. Louis was a place where popping was happening. Eh? <laughs> but uh, I, I don't want to make it sound like that that's all I knew about. But if you're going to go to St. Louis, that's what you were going to get some of. And fighting, woo, nighttime in St. Louis, you'd not be cut up somewhere if you go on to St. Louis and such. I knew all about that. I got work. I got work as a washerwoman, earning about a, earning not too much a day, and I, I was, uh, I, I did earn enough to to try to help my daughter go to the school. And it, there was a school at the church, Paul, uh, Saint Paul A M E African Methodist Episcopal Church. And the truth was, most folk had a little bit more money than I ever saw. But I, they had a school there and they allowed my daughter to go to school there and to learn there. 
I paid them a little bit. And their kindness was such that I determined that whenever there was something that was needed, I would give it my all and I would help to make others' lives happier. That's what I tried to do. I remember one time there was a woman who, whose home had burned down. They asked me if I would collect things for, for the house, and I did. I went about everywhere, and I got two large bags of food and things for her to wear and things for a new house. People were most surprised. But I could talk somebody into giving a little bit, particularly if I believed that. Well, I got married again, and uh, he was one of those popping men, <laughs> looking good. At least he looked good until he raised his hand to my face. And that was the last I saw of him. Didn't need nothing to do with him. I was a washerwoman. And, and what that meant was that uh, I would walk up the head, walk up the hill to where the white folks live up the hill. Almost all of us washerwomen would walk up there on Mondays and we'd put on our hat. We'd carry them large baskets all empty and we'd fill them up with from the houses where the white folk were, fill them on up and walk our way on down. They even had a song called the Washerwoman Blues, come on home to what we have. And we'd go out there over by the water and, and oh, just many of us would get out there and we'd clean those clothes, work, work in those washboards as hard as we could, using lye on our hands a good bit to get the stains out of things. And, and, and that's what we did. But that lie on our hands and the fact that we didn't eat the best of foods either, car they barely afford nothing, well, touching my head all the time, my hair was coming out. It was coming in clumps and lumps, and it was just coming out horribly. And that's why I wore a scarf around my head. The truth of it is, when they talked about us in the washerwoman blues, all the women wearing colorful turban around their head, it wasn't because of anything nice, it's because our hair was coming out. And so we, we wore that around colorful like. I hate how my hair looked. Didn't like it at all. I wanted to use something and nothing seemed to work. And then I met Annie Turnbo Malone. Now the truth of it is, Annie, Annie had made a product that I wanted to try on my hair. And I did. And my hair came back so nicely. Oh my goodness. It actually came back better than it ever had been before. Well, Annie, Annie was having ladies purchase some of these and then sell it to other ladies. Well, I certainly haven't seen it help me. I certainly began to use it myself. I began to sell it myself. I couldn't wait to sell it. It was a wonderful product. At least I said so, and I, and I believed it. And I sold it and I got a little money in my pocket and, and then I met CJ, CJ Walker. <laughs> oh, Lord. He was a papa too, but he was one of those men that had dreams. He had big dreams. My daughter had gotten older by that time and she moved on and had gone, was in school over in Tennessee, getting some more of her education. So it was just me and I could, I, I'd use the money to help her get there. And, and I was a little lonely and CJ came up with those, those dreams. And Charles Walker, oh, I just, he just made me believe it. Charles Johnson Walker, that's his name. I liked his dreams. I had big dreams too. The truth of the matter is you got to have big dreams, but you can't just sit with dreams. You gotta make your dreams happen. You have to work on them. Dreams don't just <laughs> pop, they pop up to your head. Any dream can pop up your head, but you can't just sit there. You got to do something with it. Well, CJ and I talked and talked long into many a night. And folks was leaving. They were leaving St. Louis. They were leaving the South. There was there was so much that was horrible down in the South. They, they, they had, the Ku Klux Klan was coming through, and people were scared. And and and, and plus, they'd offered opportunities. There were places you could go. The West was opening up. The Midwest was opening up. They were saying, uh, come, this will be an exodus for you. And they called us exodusters. 
we left the South and we started hitting on and, and CJ and I were just the same. So we climbed on a, climbed on a chair, climbed on a train and we made our way to Denver, Colorado. What do we have in Denver, Colorado? Not a nair thing. <laughs> I came with a couple dollars in my hand. I mean, a couple dollars. When I say a couple, I mean two. Two dollars in my pocket. But we went up there dreaming. Charles, he got himself some work. And, and I, I, uh, I started working at the pharmacy that was there. And as I worked in the pharmacy, and I was selling some of the, some of the Annie Turnbow. And then, well... Then I started looking at how I could do this. And the next thing I knew, I had made something that I knew was better than what Annie Turnbow Malone made. Now, the truth of it is, if somebody come up to you and say, I took Annie Turnbow Malone's uh, uh, formula, you look them in the eye and say, Madam C.J. Walker wouldn't do that because I wouldn't. I'm a woman of integrity. Always have been, always will be. I can't help it then if Annie Pope Turnbow, I can't help it if she didn't keep her money right. But she didn't have as much, she didn't have any luck with men like I didn't have any luck with men. And, and the truth of it is that by the time she married a, a, the, the man last name of Pope and became Annie Turnbow Malone Pope, well, that man, he took about all the money she had. But don't you come to me saying that I had done something wrong and, and took her things. I didn't do that and I didn't stop her from still selling things. But I did become her competitor. And the truth of it is, I learned some things from her, but I also learned some other things, like dreaming big. Once I had made it and I used it on my hair, it worked even better. And I sold it to a couple of ladies and it worked really better. And, and I started to read and learn some more about how to do the, the how to how to get your hair right. How to eat right, how to have the right kind of putting on of the shampoo and then the pomade that you use for the hair grower. And, and then I, I started working with the, the, the heat and combs and, and changing things there. I started doing that. I created what I called the Walker Method and I started teaching it. Folks started wanting to buy more. Well, my sister Lavinia, she had, she had died and her, her two girls came up and they was old enough. They start helping me bottle some of this together and begin to sell it. And they sell a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And then I decided, I decided to do something didn't see many folk do unless they had a good bit of money. I put a full length ad out, a full length ad in the newspaper. The whole page was nothing but my kind of things my products that I was selling. A full length ad in the paper. Oh, everybody thought I had lost my good sense doing that, spending that much money. But I had seen it. Sears did it, Sears and uh, Roebuck did it, Woolworths did it. Why wouldn't I do it? Put it in there. At least it would say, it would show that I, well, that I had something to offer. And so I did. And wouldn't you know, that that there ad, it just had folks see me. Look at that ad. Everything I had right there. Mm -hmm. All the preparations. That's what I called it. And folks saw it. I had given my name. I, I called myself and all my products, Madam C.J. Walker. You see, it was well known that the French ladies called themselves Madam. And, and French ladies, and, and, uh, and that was real fancy life. And, and then uh, if I gave myself his his name, it would sound like it was more fancy. It doesn't sound quite as good if you say Sarah Breedlove products. So I, I took CJ's name, Madam CJ Walker. It rang pretty. And I sold so much. I sold more than I could think. A year later, that $2 I had started off with, long when I got to Denver, that thing had turned over more and more and more until I was near to $500 in a year. And then after that, it, it increased even more and year upon year, I was watching the money happen. My daughter came home and that was nice. She had come home from, come home from school and, and uh, she also had some men troubles. We, 
never did do men real good. All I can tell you ever about men is, well, they don't always prove to be as good as you think they are. And if you got one that's good, try to keep them. But if they bad, get rid of them as quick as you can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, we grew and we grew and we grew and, and ladies started joining us and, and we had so much that we, we need to open a factory. We thought about it. My daughter and I thought about it. My daughter suggested Pittsburgh. That's where all that uh, all the steel things were, and and people were there, and there was there was there was space there that you could get something, and so we we opened a factory, and my daughter opened a beauty school. That's when she became a Lilia by that time, and so it became a Lilia, and and we opened a beauty school and a factory. We had more ladies. That was a oh I, I think about 1908. 1908. In reality, it it was 19 1904. When we got to, when we got to Denver, yeah, 1904, 1905, something like that. When we got to Denver, it had hardly been no time at all. And the, the company just grew and grew. Well, soon we, we became too big for Pittsburgh. I started looking. Plus my daughter had married a man who had not been a good man and she wanted to get away from where he was, and I thought that would be best. And I started looking. I wanted to be someplace where everybody had to go through. Some place where if you had to, if you're going from east to west, you had to go through. If you're going from uh, south to north, you had to go through. Some place that everybody had to go through. It was Indianapolis. Every train, every train went to Indianapolis. And it had a large colored section of folks that were doing good things, its own colored newspaper, its own colored uh, people that were doing living quite well. I decided I would buy the land there. I was able to buy some land and I began to build a company. I worked out of my house for a little bit and even had people boarding at my house. And I was even doing cleaning and washing for a little while just to make sure I had enough money to be able to keep that building built. But I did. I opened up Madam C.J. Walker Manufacturing Company. It opened in 1910. <laughs> Why? That wasn't even, it was just eight years ago it opened. Oh my goodness. How could it, how could time have gone by that fast? And it grew and I, I employed ladies and I got Violet. Violet became my secretary and she helped me with my speaking. I'm always learning a new word a day. Yes, indeed. A new word a day. And I believed in cleanliness and loveliness. And I, I really meant that. But I also, I wasn't making money just for myself. Now, I want you to hear me on this. I know some of you out there are making very good money and you're putting it to everything is just for you. Oh, I tell you, I'm not in that camp. I believe the money I make, yes, it can get me the nice things. But I makes the money I do so I can turn it in to helping other people. And that happened while I was in Indianapolis as well. While they were trying to build a YMCA. To have those young men have a place to go. They need a colored YMCA. At Mr. Um, what was it? I don't remember who it was. Maybe it was Pennies. Or I can't remember if it was Pennies or, or if it was uh, or Woolworths. One of them uh, that said uh, they would give a certain amount of money if the if the colored community would also give a certain amount of money. I said, that would be fine. I gave over half of the money that was needed. Well, they brought in Booker T. Washington to come and speak. Booker T. Ah, I like Booker T. I cannot say that it was a mutual feeling, though. I had met Booker T or heard him the first time when the uh, the World Fair was in St. Louis in 04. And uh, I'd been to the fair. They had one day that was called the Colored Day, and we all got to go around. And I saw Booker T come in with his wife, his second wife, and her hair was up and beautiful. Oh, I, I wanted so much. It's one of the reasons I wanted my hair to look so good was because of that. I, 
I looked at them and I saw them so well. So when I began to make money and Booker had started his, his Tuskegee Institute, well, I wrote to him and said, you should have a beauty school or a culturist school, beauty culturist, that's what I called it. And he promptly wrote back and said, no, we do not need to have that. That is not the way that we need to go. There are better jobs for black folk to have. And I wrote back, you need to have a beauty culturist school. And I sent him some money. He wrote me back that he did not need a beauty culture school, but he kept my money. Mm -hmm. We were not communicating very well. I believe that we need to have, this is one of those vocations. He was teaching vocation, having your own. And why couldn't ladies be seen as having their own and, and, and be able to take care of hair? Wasn't that important? But he didn't agree. Well, he didn't come to see me or, or even respond to me. He would have somebody else even respond in the letters. And then after I helped to, to make that, that the YMCA happen, <laughs> who they invite? Booker T. Washington. You should see the picture of the four of us, uh, me and Booker T. and Ken and the man in charge of the of YMCA. We all standing side by side. He looks like he's the angriest thing he ever seen. He didn't want to be there. <laughs> But I believed that women could choose to do this work and truly be able to give to their communities. So when I went from home to home, as I taught the ladies to go from home to home, I taught them about helping women to understand that they could lift their families up, that they could work alongside their husbands, and that together they could pull themselves and their families into places that would allow them to become free, allow them to be a, become a part of the democracy that we have here. I believed in that. I put my money to the National Council for Negro Women. I believed in the work uh, that uh, was being done through them. When they were raising money for a girl in Richmond who, a, a girl, a girl, she was merely 11 years old and she had been struck and beaten bad by her master, uh, by her mistress, and she responded and her mistress did die. They put that child in a jail. Grown women. I put my money to make sure that she was given a way to have a way out. I found ways to give money back. And when the NAACP began, they asked me to be on the board. I had intended to be there for that first meeting, but. I had also been asked to go and and talk with uh, talk with Woodrow, President Wilson about the 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 ill of lynching that was happening all through the South. We were given an appointment and I was asked to be there and I went there. We sat in that way, place waiting to talk to the president. He having agreed to speak with us. And then after hours, he had some some young lackey come out and tell us that he had he had to sign a farm bill and had no time for us. But I believed and still believe that our money is not just made for us. Yes, I have a fine house. Yes, I wear minks and I have my organ that in my house. I have fine things. But I ensure that community gets that first. That's what I believe. I've almost spoken too much, but I did say I would I would at least tell you uh, just a, a tad more and then, and then I will be quiet and and uh, oh oh I see. I am so sorry. Miss I say I get so excited sometimes. Uh, you have a question for me. Please, please, please stop. Yeah, thank you, Madam Walker. Um yes, yeah. Linda would like to know more about your business model. Did you um, mail your products to customers or did you have a storefront? Oh, a storefront. <laughs> oh, sweet lady. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, it, it, they would barely, uh, to a, a colored woman, give a storefront, barely able to have something like that. No, no, no. I followed part of the uh, part of the uh, practice that Annie Turnbow Malone did. And that was that uh, we went from person to person. That is the best way to sell. You go from person to person. What I believed was you went to a person and you taught them the Walker method of doing hair. You would do their hair for them. Excuse me. Show them the value of the product that they would see upon their head. 
talk to them about what they can bring to their family and have them purchase all of the products that you bring in and ask them if they wanted to be a walker woman. That's how I did my business. I would mail it to wherever it needed to go, but I would also get women on board so that I would get a piece, a, a part, a portion of whatever the women sold. Uh, I would get a portion of that. And I was very proud of my model. I, I did even better than, uh, than, than Annie, I would say, because I encouraged the women to look at ways they could help their community. It was just two years ago here at Villa Lerero, my home here in, in, uh, in, my home here in, in New York, uh, in, in near Terrytown, and uh, right here that I brought all the ladies, ladies from all over the country, if they had met a certain goal in actually selling, they all got to come right here. And we shared prizes and gifts, and I was so proud of them. Those that gave the most to the community received the highest praise. And I can say, can say with great, the great, um, uh, with great uh, assurity uh, that, is that a word? I'll, I'll have to ask a, a Violet about that, but assurance is a word, yes. A great assurance that my ladies, the ones that give the most in the community, also do the very best in regards to making the most money for their own families. I have been the reason that some women have risen out of poverty with their husbands and their children. Now, that did not mean that everybody liked it. As you can tell, I talked to you about uh, Booker T. Washington. He also had the National Council of Negro Businesses. They met a couple of times a year, and I, I wanted to be a part of that, but they refused, Booker refused to acknowledge and have my business acknowledged. Well, when they were in Chicago in 1913, when they were in Chicago, I had my chauffeur drive my car up there. And I went up there with my mink on and everything and met Kenneth Walker, who was at that time, uh, he was the newspaper man over in, uh, for the colored newspaper in Indianapolis. And I told Kenneth I wanted him to introduce me and he wanted to as well. But every time he got around to it, Booker T would move on to somebody else. Every time I got around to standing up, he would move on to somebody else. Until finally, finally, uh, Kenneth said something and told that I was here in the audience. He was able to say it, and uh, and he turned to me to speak, and Booker T got ready to look at somebody else, and I stood up and I said, I am a woman who came from the cotton fields of the South. From there, I was promoted to the wash tub. From there, I was promoted to the cook kitchen. And from there, I promoted myself into the business of manufacturing hair goods and preparations. And I have made my own factory on my own ground. And then when I told them how much money I was making in the hundreds of thousands, <laughs> you can be assured that the men there were quite impressed. But Booker T, not so much. After I spoke, he immediately spoke not at all to me and went to the next thing on the schedule. But I had spoken. And I would not sit around waiting for that man to see me. I would make sure I was seen. Men seeing me, uh, that is another subject. My daughter nor I have ever been very lucky in the ways of men, to be certain. But I had thought with CJ, with his big dreams. But then CJ started to think that, well, my dreams were too big. And the truth was, his dreams he didn't go after. He became one of the district, one of the regional managers for me. Did quite well, but she was married to the boss. And then I, I heard rumors. So I went to his region one day and I found that with some Walker woman, a woman that worked for me, 
that he and her had come together, taken my product and had taken off, taken off my own labels and created a label of their own and put it on and were selling it. I was furious. But you have to know what to do with your anger. When I went in for a divorce, I asked for one thing, to be able to keep my name, CJ Walker. And I allowed him to continue to work for me. I will tell you, he is not with me anymore, but he's certainly still a happy man with the amount of money he raised <laughs> that he gets every year. My daughter then moved to Harlem. Oh, you all know Harlem in 1915, 1916. Everybody was in Harlem. James Weldon Johnson, his brother Rosamund, W.B. Du Bois was there. And, oh, they were having these young writers, Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes. Langston, quite a fine young man. And these artists, it was as if they're was a movement of art all around Harlem. It was the place you danced and the finest dancers were there. It was the place that you had the greatest writing. People sat and they talked. And my, my daughter, she moved to Harlem from Indianapolis and started a beauty culture school there, the largest one that we had. She told me all about it. I would travel from one side of the United States to another side and up and down, selling my wares, checking on the regional directors. I wanted to go to Haiti. I wanted to go to Africa. I wanted to be able to, to create and, 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 and spread this around the world. I wanted to help women wherever they were. And I got sick. I collapsed while I was on the road and well, my two uh, lawyers, a uh, lawyer and accountant, uh, one of them is a, a Hampton University graduate, by the way. And they told me that I, I could just come home for a while. And I did. And they told me by that time, I was already making over a million dollars is what I had of my own. I didn't have to continue to do that. And I wanted to be closer to my daughter and to my adopted granddaughter. So I moved to Hudson Valley in New York, moved into Irvington on the Hudson, right beside Terrytown. I built a, a mansion there called Villa Loero. And I liked living there. And there folk come to my house and we talk and drink. And now the truth of it is, that most colored folk wouldn't even live there. Mm -mm. It's right down the street from the Rockefellers, the same street as a matter of fact. Mr. Penny's lives there. But what I learned real quick like was that the color of my money was the same color as their money. And they was all right with that. And so I lived there. I'm resting a little more than I was before, but I am going to go back on the road again soon. And uh, I, I suspect that the, by the end of this year, 1918, well, I'll still have done well. Now, I've talked a lot and I, I didn't get to all your questions about, about, uh, about the product. So I want to make sure that if you have any question for me that I answer it, I want to be clear in that so I can make sure that you have all the product and all the information that you need. Oh, and if you're wondering, This is what your hair could look like as well. <laughs> All right, are there any questions? I'd be more than happy to answer. Yes, we have um, a question from Lynn and Molly. Both of them would like to know, um, do you believe women should have the right to vote? And have you done anything to encourage the women's suffrage movement? I do believe women should have the right to vote. But the reality is that has not been the first on my list of things to talk about. I believe that people have the right to live. And I think that 
I think if the women, if the women put as much time into ensuring that there's not lynching down south as they do into wanting to get the right to vote, then they would even, they would be able to bind together. The white women always want the right to vote. And I understand that. And they certainly, certainly deserve it as well. And black women want it as well. But oftentimes they push us towards the back. I've even heard it said that there were times when they didn't even want black men to vote. They wanted to vote before then and had anger about that. And when we asked them to stand with us about anti-lynching, many of them, excuse me, many of them turned their heads and say that that is not what they, they are going to protest about. So I think that, yes, I want the right to vote, but I also want the right for people who are colored people to live. Thank you for that answer. Um, Alayla uh, heard a rumor that you opened a beauty salon in Harlem and hosted a couple annual conventions in recent years. Uh, could you talk about how your business grew and how, if you, uh, did you open a hair salon? Is that true? Oh, yes. Oh, several, several. Well, you can see me as far away as Tulsa. Fine, fine work in Tulsa, of course. Uh, Tulsa was uh, one of those places that has an amazing, amazing opportunities there. It is growing. They call it the Black Wall Street there. And there's a reason why so much money that is there. They are doing quite well. Well, I have Madam Walker shops right there. There's Beauty Culturist and there's a beauty shop there. So some of the Walker women are there. So as far away as there, all the way to California in Los Angeles. And then, of course, over into the north, uh, northeast and over into the south as well. So, yes, I've opened many shops. And the shop in Harlem, though, was started by uh, by my daughter. Uh, oh, you know, I do believe that uh, that uh, but by my my daughter, Alilia. And uh, if I may be so bold that there's a young lady on here who seems to have the same name as that. My, it's so strange. You know, my daughter's name was Lilia. She just added the extra A on to be all fancy about it. But yes, in Harlem, she had a wonderful, and she was known. <laughs> she was known to my daughter Lilia to always have the most fancy of places. People would come and eat and drink, and, and she opened her home to everyone. And anyone who was anyone would come to my daughter's house. Of course, they came to my home as well, but Lilia had that she just she had a way to bring people in and that smile she had on her face <laughs> i don't know how you got her name ma'am but i'm glad to find out how somebody else got my daughter's name i never thought it would ever go anyplace else i told her the same thing as well uh, did you ask did she ask me anything else i think it was just about that right uh yeah i think she's going to connect with you after the program oh that would be just about and then uh, one more question for you, Madam Walker, and that's yes. from uh, Craig. Craig would like to know if you ever had the opportunity to get a formal education, and if so, what did you what did you do? I haven't had a formal education. I got some education when I was young, very very young, but uh, having a secretary has helped me more than anything else to learn and to practice words. I, I believe in education. Uh, but anything formalized, I, I haven't had. But I do believe in learning as much as you can and constantly learning. And so I have someone that always is with me to help me learn more along the way. Well, thank you, Madam Walker. Oh, it's, it is wonderful. Well, I must be going. I Now, I, I will let you know that I've let Miss Hannah, I have told her that she has kept a few of my things. So if you'd like to talk with her, I'm trying to get Hannah to be one of my Walker ladies. Now, I don't have very many white Walker ladies, but I don't mind having them as long as they do what I asked them to do. And Hannah seems to be, well, look at her hair. Doesn't it look nice? I might have had something to do with that. And so I want to make sure that you have an opportunity to get the product. Now, remember, you want to do it the Walker method. Use nothing else. No other product is going to let your hair grow thick and let your hair grow longer and be able to make you a person that if you become a Walker lady can lift your family out from wherever they are and you can be in your community as a leader and help your community grow. I say this to you. 
remember. Remember to give back to your community. Remember you have that if you are not giving back to your community, it will never grow for you. With great kindness. Thank you. Thank you all. So thank you to Madam Walker, but now I'd like to welcome to the stage uh, performer Sheila Arnold, uh, who was uh, uh, the one who uh, uh, presented this program with us tonight. Sheila has presented with us for several years in a row now. Um, <laughs> and I always just think she does a great job being in character. And if you have time to stick around, Sheila, we'd love to talk to you a little bit more. Oh my gosh, I'm sitting over here and I'm about to break out into a sweat because Miss Alilia Bundles, and I need you to bring, if she's willing to come over, um, I have the Miss Alilia Bundles who wrote the, which I was gonna show you all just a few seconds uh, it, it, before I left today, I was actually gonna show this to you. Um, so that's really funny that she, it's not really funny, it's just absolutely petrifying um, that she's here. But she wrote the definitive, the definitive book on Madam C.J. Walker, On Her Own Ground, The Life and Times of Madam C.J. Walker. And she is the great, great granddaughter, if I'm correct about that, great, great granddaughter of, uh, of uh, Madam C.J. Walker. I may have the greats wrong, but I hope I don't. Um, and she also used to be a, a TV correspondent and she continues to travel and share uh, about her her uh, great great grandmother great great grandma I think I have that right great great grandmother's uh, legacy and such like that and so what a delight and absolutely petrifying so just for anybody in here who ever wants to know do we ever get scared as performers yeah I, I like dead people who have all their people dead and uh, so when their people are alive you're always like ah! So oh, that's just wonderful. So she has her hand up. I don't know what that means. <laughs> so, so Lilia, um, I can promote you to a panelist if you'd like to speak. Um, I just need you to send me a quick message uh, verifying that you want that before I put you in the spotlight. Absolutely. So if you'll just Absolutely. send me a quick message and let me know if you'd like to promote to a panelist, <laughs> I'd be happy to do that. Um, while we wait for Alilia to tell me if she wants to be promoted. Um, yes, she does. Okay, here we go. Gracious. Okay. And you did join muted, so you'll need to unmute yourself before you speak. And to those of you who didn't follow the conversation quite uh, quite where we are, this is Madam C.J. Walker's great, great granddaughter, who I did not know was going to be attending tonight. So welcome to the stage. So Sheila, you were wonderful. I just, I, I listen, I know that it, <laughs> but you know, be, the power of Google alerts. <laughs> <laughs> whenever, whenever I see something with Madam Walker, I try to tune in. And I actually, I live in D.C., so I'm I not, know, I'm I know you far, do. I'm not far away. Oh. Um, but I was delighted to see you. And you have such a range of characters that you that you do. So thank you for including Madam Walker. You know, and you just the fact that you're able to do this uh, extemporaneously is pretty, you know, pretty amazing. So. Great, great job. I, I have a, I have a few things. You and I should talk. I can fill in a few blanks. Good, I, will, I will tell you on the suffrage thing, I, like you, thought for a long time, I'm like, well, I know she was in the National Association of Colored Women and the, and the friends were involved in the suffrage movement. But just last year during the centennial, I discovered some new research. And I mean, and this is one of the things that, as you know, when you're doing a famous person, you're mm -hmm. always discovering something new. And now with so many databases, newspapers um, that are digitized, so there's still new information. So yeah. you and I should schedule a talk, a time to talk, and mm -hmm. I can answer questions. And, you know, and I just, I thank you so much for putting the energy and the hard work into it. Thank you. I will tell you that you might not remember this and you all get to hear a little behind the scenes, um, but I read your book and I actually emailed you at one time, early, early, early long time ago when I first started and asked a couple of questions and your response was definitely go and portray her. And oh, you, you had, you had, you, you continuously encouraged uh, women to 
tell the story, the legacy, and to keep that alive. And you've been such an encouragement for more than, because I'm certainly not the only one that portrays her. And, uh, and I have great friends that have, and others have also heard from you that you have been one of the ones that have said, yes, go and do, you know, tell the story. So thank you um, for your encouragement, for your research, your encouragement, um, and for keeping that alive. It's exciting that, you know, there was now a movie about her and that was just great. Right, and, right. Um, and uh, so I did not that, watch the movie. So yeah, was well, that good? <laughs> <laughs> no, the movie was the movie was uh, inspired by my book. My book was optioned for that, but I I thought that the um, you know the Hollywood treatment really distorted yeah. who she was. So I'm I love that you're doing what you're doing. There is a um, Hannah, not to go on and on, but I just wanted to share this with the audience. Um, at the Indiana Historical Society, which you probably are very well aware of, there are more than 40,000 digitized pages of Madam Walker's letters. So, you know, if you want to go down a deep rabbit hole, you can look at those. But there's also an exhibit um, that has been up and will be up for another year. But they they have a section where there it's Madam Walker's office from 1915, and there are actors who portray her and interact with the visitors. So that's something, you know, it's obviously you can't go to Indianapolis, but but I love what they do because they do such deep research like you do to try to, you know, really stay um, close to the facts about her life. I just, I, I'm delighted. So for all of y'all who are here, you're seeing something that often we don't get to do or even show in front of everybody else. So, you know, when you get to meet a person connected with them and, and uh, the only other time this has ever happened to me was with Daisy Bates. Oh, so wow. Portrayed Daisy Bates on Daisy Bates Day in Little Rock. And after I finished portraying Daisy Bates, who, by the way, I don't look anything like. I really don't look anything like Madam T. Well, Walker. you know, Anna DeVere Smith doesn't look like the people that Exactly. And so, but I definitely don't look like Daisy Bates. <laughs> okay. And there's no ifs, ands. But after the program, people that knew her said, oh, I have to show you some pictures of you and I together. And all, and they went on, and I was like, "Oh, we are in a bad place." But people really think I am Daisy Bates. And even when I came out of character, there were people walking up to me to go, "Oh my goodness, I remember this about you!" And they thought I was still her. Wow. And um, I will tell you, I was in. Um, so here's a fun story. I know we got to ask questions, but y'all are getting a little bit of behind the scenes. I was in Oklahoma, um, and that's I know Tulsa because of the, there are several advertisements for Walker women down that way. Right. It's, very popular. But I was in Oklahoma and I was uh, doing the program in character. And then right after I uh, did the program, let's see if I can get, no, it's not helping me. No. Okay. So right after I did the program, um, there were two African American women. They were elderly African American women. And even though I had introduced myself, they came up and they said, You said you had some product. Do you have the product on you? And I said, um, no, they said, but you said you had some product, which I had said in character. Right. And I said, no, I'm so sorry. I don't have the product on me. She said, we can't find anything as good as that product. That was the, <laughs> that product was excellent. That was excellent. And uh, one of the women, the woman that gave me the hat that I wear, she actually, re she is the one that told me the story of the Walker women and how in her community, all the girls used to dress up like the walker women oh love it because when the walker women came around that's what the girls wanted to be like they wanted oh, to be great. the walker women and i believe and nobody else has to believe this with me i believe mary Kay met a walker woman <laughs> i was a mary Kay consultant when i started to do uh the research for for madam cj walker i was actually a mary Kay consultant and everything that in may uh that madam cj walker was doing is what Mary Kay ended up doing. Hmm. But Madam C.J. Walker was doing it long before. Yes, yeah, so, well, Madam Walker's first convention was two years before Mary Kay was born. <laughs> exactly. And I mean, everything, so it's really interesting. I just think, I would love to know it, but I think that one day she met a Walker woman. And I well, also think that's why Mary, Mary Kay was the first, you know, kind of in that 
in that kind of business, she was the first to bring an African American in to actually be in the leadership of her business. Oh, interesting. And um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know how I could ever prove that, but I right, just, right, my right. bones believe that's correct. Sorry. Okay. There's other people that have questions. I so, babbled. Yeah. And I would like to invite uh, Alila, if you, if you would like to answer some of these too, I'd be happy to keep you on here with us. Um, Cause okay. the big question i've gotten this from three or four different audience members now the biggest question people have are are these products still in use today and if not what happened to the business and if they are still in use have the formulas changed right so now, i can I, I can sheila do you want to you can i i, I was going to just say the answer is yes but you can go for the detail because <laughs> there is also an issue and i'll just before she before Lilia says anything i just want to i gave you a little bit of the detail because you may have noticed that um, she went from a husband in St. Louis that didn't quite get completely out the picture. So you may not have heard that, but that caused a problem. And then over to Ms. Bundles. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the, um, the company actually never went out of business, but mm -hmm. my family was involved until the mid 1980s. It was sold to another small entity and they, Owned, this group owned the trademark for about 30 years. But in 2013, Richelieu Dennis, the founding CEO of Sundial Brands, which makes Shea Moisture and Nubian Heritage, bought the trademark. And Sundial Brands has relaunched a line of Madam Walker products, MCJW, which were sold in um, Sephora for the last five years or so. And it they're not in Sephora right now, but they're getting ready to be relaunched. And we've been talking about the marketing. So that will happen in early 2022. The original formula is no longer made because the original formula was, with the, right, that's the most recent, thank you very much, Sheila. That's the most recent line. Um, but the original formula was really a vegetable shampoo, which was an improvement over the lye shampoo the lye-based shampoo, and then um, an ointment like Vaseline that had sulfur. And as, as um, Madam Walker slash Sheila <laughs> was telling you, this hygiene was really different at that point when most people didn't have indoor plumbing. And so people didn't wash their hair very often, sometimes not at all during the winter. And that meant they had really horrible uh, scalp infections and dandruff. And this ointment and this washing your hair more often healed the scalp and allowed people's hair to grow back. But that formula with sulfur, we, you know, we, you see sulfate free shampoo and all of that now. And there's a reason because sulfur, while then was revolutionary, is really a little harsh on the hair. So these new formulas are a hundred years of research and development. And Sheila, the women who came up to you, I still get emails from people who want that old Madam Walker's wonderful hair grower. And I have to say to them, there's something even better now. And it, it, while Madam Walker drove a Model T in 1910 and, and drove a Waverly electric car in 1913, she would have a Tesla today. So we have to move <laughs> forward with the research and development. <laughs> so I thought she had a Cadillac too, because I thought it was an, an argument piece between her and her daughter at one point. So she, she gave her daughter a Cadillac. She yeah, had, Cadillac, she okay. had um, um, a touring car. I'm just trying to, th I can't think of the name of it, but yeah. there's a letter between Madam Walker and her attorney where she says, Alelia wants a Cadillac and I found one that was slightly used. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is fascinating that she stood up to people and I mean, she did, she had amazing things. Um, you know, her house is beautiful. Um, I'm certain that, you, well, I'm not certain. I'm hoping that you've been able to visit the house at some point in time. Um, but I was honored when I got to go and visit the house and do a tour. I was the only one there that she found that I did I portray One Judge. And so she gave me the behind the scenes, Love you know, it. I got to, you know, three hours later, literally, I, you know, the pictures and everything stood in the woman's shower because it was the original uh, needle shower and I had done enough and so if you don't know a needle shower is where there are um, the the water comes out from the sides from these little pinholes and it comes out all against you in these little pinholes and I'd read that that had been in her house and there it was the same one that it was still working and I just said I, and I was like can I just stand and she thought I was weird but she let me stand in the 
you know, and it was just amazing to see that, to be a part of that. Um, so there, you know, there's a marker there uh, in Irvington on the Hudson. Um, and there's a lot of people that are in New York that don't even know that right. she's there, which just always stuns me. Well, you know, one nice piece of a um, little factoid on that is that Rich Lou Dennis, who CEO of Sundial, um, actually a foundation that he created actually now owns the house. And when Rich sold um, Sundial to Unilever, even though he still has some involvement, but when he sold Sundial to Unilever a couple of years ago, part of the proceeds that he gained from that, he used to set up a um, venture capital fund for women of color entrepreneurs called New Voices Fund. So obviously during the pandemic, there can't be events there, but the women who are part of those um, cohorts will actually be able to spend some time in the house. It, it won't be like open to the public in general, but there will be some things that are going on there. But isn't it a magical place? It is absolutely magical. When I found out that he purchased it, I have this dream. So I, I have a dream of having um, having to see if we can get enough money for some women, uh, African-American women that portray women of history to actually have a conference together. Oh, that's a great to idea. Learn from each other. Um, because idea. we don't get to see each other, but we are doing this really, really good work. Um, and many of us don't know that there are, there are fellowships and grants and those kind of things, which uh, Hannah's had me already talk about because I was at Mount Vernon. So sorry, okay, be quiet. Okay, speaking of fellowships and grants, and Sheila, I want you to keep talking about this all you want. I'm really just sitting here letting you guys talk, peppering in the questions as I get the chance. So this is the best Zoom bombing ever as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, yes, I guess I was Zoom bombing. <laughs> So uh, we actually have an audience question for you, Ms. Bundles. Um, are you involved in any of the scholarships or grants that are given in honor of Madam C.J. Walker? How involved are the family with that legacy? You know, it's, um, <laughs> it's a wild, wild west kind of thing. So there are some things that I'm, I'm involved with. The Madam Walker Legacy Center in Indianapolis, which mm -hmm. like the, like the little world is a National Historic Landmark. I'm a former board member there. There, the National um, Coalition of 100 Black Women has chapters all over the country, but three of them, Philadelphia, Las Vegas, and San Francisco do annual Madam Walker luncheons. So I'm involved with that. There are other people who have named things after Madam Walker. I'm, I'm not definitely not involved in, you know, probably the majority of them. There are some that I participate in. Another, the Center for Leadership Development in Indianapolis has a Madam Walker Award. I try to, you know, pay attention because I, there was somebody who named an, a scholarship after Madam Walker, and then they didn't give the money to the person. So I'm very, you know, reluctant about that kind of thing because I, I don't want her name to be used when people aren't on the up and up. <laughs> Uh, so I see a, a question here from Molly Kerr. May I answer it, Miss Hannah? Yes, absolutely. But I wanted to tie your the asking of this question in with another question. Okay, very good. If you don't mind. Um, we did have a Stephanie asked uh, if you were the one she saw at the Duncan Library um, as uh, as Zora Neale Hurston. Yes, so for the, for the <laughs> audience, uh, Sheila has appeared at Duncan Library as Zora Neale Hurston, Fannie Lou Hamer, and One Judge. She's also done an oral history storytelling program with us. So she's done a whole lot. So that leads me to ask Sheila, why Madam Walker? How did you get involved with Madam Walker? OK, I'm going to tell you the true story since you're adults. <laughs> <laughs> I was asked by a school um, would I come and tell a story about a woman in business? And I said, certainly, because, you know, you're a performer and you say yes to everything. <laughs> so I said, certainly I will. I said, well, what's the name of the person? And I went, Walker. He said, okay, what's the first name? Um, I think it's um, Madam Walker. Now, what I was thinking in my head was actually Maggie Walker, the banker. But that's not what I said. So when I went back to go look up Madam Walker, I went, oh, this is what, what I meant. I meant Maggie Walker. But by that time, they'd already announced it. And so I was on the hook 
for Madam Walker. And so that was the first time I'd ever even learned anything about her. Wow. And so probably 2006, 2005, 2006, something like that. So, um, and so it was completely by happen chance, but it was perfect. It was definitely God wanting me to learn it because I was a Mary Kay consultant at the time. So I completely connected completely connected to what she was doing, completely got things. I, I think I got things that maybe some might not have gotten about the business part because it was like, I know this pattern. This is the pattern I'm living right now. And I had just finished reading Mary Kay's biography. Uh -huh. And when I picked up Madam, when I picked up your book um, on her own ground and I went, oh my gosh, this is the same stuff. This is it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I portrayed her. And at first I went to the elementary school as Madam CJ Walker. I came, I had my hat, the wig, I had the outfit, I had the gloves and I came in and I was sitting there and I said, um, yes, I, I am here for da, da 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 very proper, which, you know, I go in and out with the proper because I think that she might've tried to be proper. Who knows? I don't know. I don't know what she sounds like, but I also think that when she got excited, she got Southern. So that would have been really what I would think. But anyhow, I was there and I was in the office and I was waiting. I had my ankles crossed. I was all perfect with the hat on. And this little girl came to be picked up by her mother. And so she, they called her down and she gets there. And on her way out, she says, mommy, I want to be her. <laughs> It was, and she had not even heard me do the, and she was leaving, so she wasn't going to hear me. She's like, I want to be her. And it was just oh, the most. That is so wonderful. <laughs> because they didn't see anybody, you know, that kids don't see anybody with gloves on. Right. That just right. doesn't happen. Somebody with gloves on, somebody that wears a hat, someone that is, um, you know, someone that's, you know, self taught. I mean, I just, I'm so impressed by what she taught herself. Um, it's pretty amazing, you know, but you know, uh, yeah, so I, I have to say that your, your, that story with the little girl, I, I really love interacting with young people. I do a lot of national history day, <laughs> you know, helping yeah, people, so but when you're telling that story with the Netflix series, I had it, as a, it, my book was optioned and then, but it's a Hollywood version versus mm -hmm. a nonfiction documentary. Definitely. And I had script review, not approval or veto. And I didn't really like the direction that the head writer and the showrunners were taking because they were trying to make it appealing, they thought, to a young contemporary audience. Mm -hmm. And so they focused on kind of a, what I thought ended up being a cat fight between Madam Walker and Annie Malone, which I, but, I but they, they made it into a, you know, there were the, the first version of the script, they were cursing at each other. They were, you know, they were just sort of acting like Real Housewives of Atlanta. They dialed that back a bit, but my argument against like, they're trying to make it feel contemporary and appealing was we should show the dignity of these women that mm -hmm. yes, they could throw shade, but they didn't do it in a, you know, ratchet kind of way. <laughs> So I thank you for I mean, insisting on that. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I really feel like um, we demean what our, you know, what my mom, my mom, if she liked you, she could, you know, she could play with you a little bit. She didn't like you. She was as nice as mm -hmm. you could ever want her to be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and the, and I would, and the guy would say, I think your mom liked me. Oh, she hated you. I'm just here to tell you. <laughs> but she treated me so good. Yeah, she hated you. Mm -hmm. I'm here to tell you, mm -hmm. you know, but she never let, and I always used to say, and I still say that the Southern women, so, particularly Southern Negro women, uh, were Southern tea women, sweet tea women can curse you out and you feel good about it in the morning. Mm -hmm. You're like, wow. And then you go later on, I think she cursed at me. But I never heard it come out of her mouth because of the way that they carried themselves. That's right. That, Bless your heart. Oh, that is where it comes from, you know. <laughs> and it's really, um, but it makes a big difference, and it is very compelling. I don't go anywhere without this, where kids are just like, "Wow," because they want to hear who is this person that is so different from me. Mm -hmm. What does she have to offer? And then when she starts talking, when she talks about not just and I do, I, my mom died and she had a, a mink. So when I go someplace now, I'll actually go with my mink on. That's the only time I wear a mink, but I'll go with the mink. Even if it's in the summertime, I'll go with the mink because I'll say, you know, well, when you have a mink, you might as well wear the mink. So I go with the mink, you know, I just say, but it also, it's that, that moment of just, because she, she transfers that 
And everything I've read, she gave so much to the community. She kept giving and giving and looking for ways of giving. And that is what really appeals to the young people. It's not that she just made a bunch of money. Right. It's that she did something with that money. Right. And she, she, yes, she had a fine mansion, but that's not what she was most proud of. She was proud of the places that she gave and she constantly was looking for that. It's just, I, I think that's, that's a compelling story that we can just have told by itself. And I don't believe, because now I've been where Annie Turnbow Pope lived and met people up in that area. There was, I never got that sense of, you know, they may not, they didn't appreciate some things about each other, but I haven't gotten that sense from anything I've read that it was this huge full on animosity. Yeah, um, yeah right. and I've gotten that, so sorry. Well, speaking of animosity, uh, Dina would like to know why Booker T. Washington didn't seem to like Madam Walker. It was the job. He did not, uh, everything I've read, seen about it, he just did not appreciate that being seen as the kind of vocation that anybody should, it shouldn't be looked at as a vocation. And he was very much into having a vocation, you know, that, and that you should be working with your hands and making the best of yourself and looking like you can be of promise to the community and showing how the black community can be uh, helpful with the white community. Um, and, but he didn't see that as being um, something that was a vocation. Mm -hmm. and, and they didn't, and it truly is, if you could ever see the picture of her and him at the YMCA, he looks not happy. <laughs> he just doesn't look, he just really, it, it's really quite a funny picture. To me it is, because he just, he doesn't look like he's very happy to be there. Um, uh, but, in you know, but he, you know, he had to deal with her whether he wanted to or not. Right. And so you may have more information about that. Yeah, you uh, know, I think it was a complicated relationship and especially for people who saw self-made since you haven't seen it, you're not, you know, soiled by, <laughs> by that. But but I think the uh, the writers sort of painted him as entirely a misogynist and totally disrespectful. But I think there's a, the relationship was complex and nuanced so that it started out really on a bad foot when she made that speech. But then when he came to this dedication, as you see of the YMCA, mm -hmm. at that point, I mean, he had invited her back as a keynote speaker the next year. She sent her chauffeur to pick him up at the train station and he was a guest in her home. And Madam Walker and mm -hmm. his wife, Margaret Murray Washington were friends. She actually helped my grandmother get into Spelman. So they, you know, they kept them. Um, a relationship, but he was used to calling the shots and she was pushing her way in and he was resistant to that. So it is a, it's an interesting, complicated relationship, which is always the most interesting when you're dealing with historic figures. Yes, yes. And, and but she, she never stopped trying with him. I mean, That's just, right. I mean, so it wasn't like she just said, well, forget you, I'm going to do my own. She really, you know, she wanted that relationship to work. Um, and, and I'm glad, um, I do now remember there was something about her coming, him coming to her home. I'll have to mm -hmm. go back and look at that more. Yeah. more. Well, 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 you and I will talk about that. But, you know, one of that, that's one of the things that I, you know, when I'm, I've been talking to a lot of, um, you know, sort of Black employee corporate groups, because everybody's trying to do the, you know, reckoning right now. And, and I, especially because I'm of a certain age and have been through my corporate life, one of the, I use that story because it's like, there's always somebody who's gonna be in your way and not your champion, but you don't have to grovel, but you can speak up as which, which is what she did and speak your truth and find some kind of detente. And so I think it's a good, you yes. know, lesson to learn. It is. And then sometimes you just have to walk away because people are really horrible. <laughs> you all have been such a great audience. I'm just here to tell you because um, we are over the hour time definitively, that is for sure. Uh, and you've gotten a chance to hear lots of different conversation. So I want to say thank you uh, to this wonderful audience that has come in and they've just kind of sat around going, if, if, if we just, if we're just really quiet, they'll just keep talking. And it, <laughs> I'm letting this happen for as long as it happens for. Um, so if you need to jump off, I understand. Um, no, no, no. I, I, 
I I you actually know. am gonna go because I, I think Sheila, you should get the, the stage for the of rest of the do. time. But I am so glad to connect. Hannah, thank you very much for hosting this. And um, you know, we'll talk and then we'll see each other in real life when the COVID is uh untamed. So she she but, has the your email address. Can can Hannah give that to me with that? Yeah, I actually right? I actually sent you an email on your website. Okay. So <laughs> Briefly, if I have one last question for you. What is one thing you would like everyone to know about your great great grandmother? Well, you know, actually, Sheila actually just said it, and that's that what you know, what's most important to me is yes, it's nice that Madam Walker was a millionaire, but it's what she did with her money mm -hmm. that she used her money and her influence to empower her community. So, Sheila has said it. Um, and Sheila said it because when long, long time ago, I wrote an email. That is what Alilia said to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, glad, I'm glad that it got through. <laughs> you know, I was clear, I am very clear when I meet people who are connected with the real person, I do what they tell me to do. And, um, so but you've taken, is, you've taken, you've infused your own experiences as well. And, and that makes it authentic. So thank you. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, All right. I really appreciate you Zoom bombing us. <laughs> <laughs> bye, bye bye. Oh, my. Wow. Sheila, do you have time for two more questions about yourself? Yes, I do. And just so everybody knows. <laughs> okay, I'm good now. <laughs> Not plans. Um, so we have two more questions for yourself, and that's what we're going to go out on. Um, the first is how did you get started in this line of work? And the second is how has your transition to virtual been? Um, I got started in this line. I've, I've always been a storyteller. I was raised in a house that was filled with stories. So, and I've been doing theater. I've been on stage since I was eight years old. Uh, so I have a lot of theater behind me and such. So that is pretty common. Then I used to work at Colonial Williamsburg. I started there in 1997, um, excuse me, 1998, and did historic character work there and eventually left in 2003. God opened a door and said, it's time for me to move out. And one of the things I knew I would do is historic character work. And so, um, but I've been talking, if you wanna know how to talk better, if you wanna know how to do more public speaking, then take every opportunity that's put before you to practice. If somebody asks you to MC, go MC. If somebody asks you to, you know, do you have a poem? Do you have a song? Do you have a, do you have a, a anything? Do that, uh, get on the stage whenever you can in whatever role. Uh, you know, don't be inappropriate, of course, but, you know, get in a, a role and uh, practice, you know, whatever level you can be in forensics or debate, um, just keep, keep going. And, um, and if there's somebody uh, that you want to portray in history, start the research, begin, and then go to a librarian and say, can I do this? <laughs> and, and see if they'll, 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 uh, they'll take you on board so you can start practicing in front of people. Um, the change to uh, virtual, uh, it's been a year for me. So I, you know, it was March, uh, almost a year. So it was March uh, 14th was the very last program that I did. Uh, well, not completely. Uh, I've had two live programs, but very, very, very distance, uh, very socially distance to do that. So, um, so that's it. Uh, uh, I've had those programs since, uh, since March 14th of last year. And what I found out real quick was like, hey, get to learn Zoom. Uh, and what I found is that I thought it was going to be fair, really separating me from other people. But what I have found is that people have felt like, um, or seem to feel like, including students in schools, like everybody has a front row seat. Nobody misses what my face looks like on a certain thing, because now everybody gets to see it up close and personal which means I have to learn all kinds of things about lighting and uh, sound and tech of all kinds of things that I never thought about before. But what people get to have is a front row seat and sometimes feel much more connected to the performance. And I find that um, I'm doing a lot of sitting. I have friends that do it all standing. I tend to do it sitting because I just can't get the backdrop right. And even my lighting today is bad because of the green screen today. But, um, but you know, I just can't get the backdrop to work well for me um, with the standing because of, of my house. So I do a lot sitting. Um, I've learned how to do sitting and how to get up close to the camera and go back. So there's been a lot of practice in, in, um, in doing this, but I have found the other thing I have found that's different is access has been different. There are people now that can see me that couldn't before. 
Someone couldn't drive at nighttime to the library, wouldn't have been able to see me, but now they can. Someone that was differently abled might not be able to see me for whatever reason, but now they can. Um, someone from over in England, you know, will see this tomorrow or, you know, over in South Africa might be watching it right now or Australia or New Zealand might be watching this right now. So it's, it's opened up access and that I hope never goes away. I hope that we realize that we can offer our programs to people that we have not been able to in the past and that we don't forget that. Thank you so much, Sheila, for joining us tonight. I put a couple links in the chat box for everyone to take a look at. I put Ms. Sheila's website on there, mishila.org, I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it, mm -hmm. And then I have um, uh, our next big Black History program. I'm very excited. Um, Dr. G, Dr. Frederick Gooding Jr. down in Texas wrote a book, um, Black Oscars, From Mammy to Minnie, what the Academy Awards tell us about African Americans. Um, and uh, if you remember the hashtag from a few years ago, hashtag so white, or Oscars mm -hmm. so white, um, that's kind of inspired him. So he's going to join us two weeks from tonight, same bat time, same bat channel, uh, to talk about that book, take your questions, and um, it's just in time for the Oscars. So I think that's wonderful. Um, I'm also really excited. Sheila put me in touch with another performer, Sarah Brady. One month from tonight, uh, Sarah Brady will join us, same bat time, same bat channel, uh, to, to, to present um, a Civil War story about two women, one from the North and one from the South. She's doing that for Women's History Month. And then Sheila will be back in April for our All Alexandria Reads program, which I'm not gonna spoil yet, but keep an eye on our online calendar, keep an eye on your curbside bags and any flyers we may be handing out in the near future. Um, I'm very excited that Sheila's gonna come back and, and sit with us again in April. Um, so always feel free to reach out to me. I'll put my email in the chat box if you have any questions about upcoming programs. Um, Ms. Sheila, how can everyone find you? Uh, they can find me at www.missheila.org, which I think you put on there already. Uh, that's the best way. My calendar is up to date, which is amazing. Uh, so, um, so feel free to, um, and then I also work with Artists Standing Strong Together. I'll put that on there. Um, and Artists Standing Strong Together is working with artists, primarily storytellers. And we do uh, programs every uh, four programs a month, five, sorry, five programs a month. Um, most of them are free. And you can come in and have storytelling programs and other kinds of things that you might enjoy. So thank you. And thank you to the Friends of uh, Friends of Duncan Library for allowing me the opportunity and Hannah for letting me come back again and again. And I cannot tell you how how precious today was to me. And, you know, I, I really can't say enough about thank you. Well, thank you. And thank you to everyone who joined us here tonight. Um, I want to say have a good night, stay safe, stay warm, stay healthy, and um, don't forget to use some library curbside services. Uh, we'll see you around. Have a good night. Okay.